Okay. Oh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us this um, afternoon. This is, I'm Mary Augusta Thomas, the Deputy Director of Smithsonian Libraries, and I'd like to welcome all of you. And I'm delighted because we see some people out here who obviously we do know in the libraries. All of us were saying that, but boy, there are a lot of you we don't know. We want to get to know you better. Um, I will tell you, uh, we'd really love to have emails if you're interested in, in hearing more about this series of talks. So if you weren't handed a sheet to fill out, go looking for one, please, before you leave, and I'll remind you. Um, this is the first in a series of events centered on paper engineering, fold, pull, pop, and turn, an exhibition in the SIL gallery that's located on this floor. The exhibition will continue to be on view through the fall of 2011. Um, if you need directions after the talk today, please just see one of the staff or grab me and we'll point you in the right direction. Pop-up and movable books have been delighting and engaging readers and non-readers, young and old alike, for nearly 800 years. Using inventive ways to fold paper and create movement, Pop-up artists and paper engineers transform the printed page from a two-dimensional to a three-dimensional experience for us. Paper engineering, fold, pull, pop, and turn, presents more than 50 examples of action-packed construction inspired wing works of art over about 500 years. So you'll see some really old examples of this in the show. We hope that our visitors will have an experience that you rarely get to see some of the older materials. We'd like you to see them as their creators intended, works that calculate, educate, entertain, and amaze. Now, we came up with paper engineering, fold, pull, pop, and turn, because that sounded like the kind of title a museum exhibition needs to have. What happens, of course, is you know somebody might wander past, they look and they go, wow, pop-ups. So really, it's the pop-up show. And that brings us to today's speaker, Ellen Rubin. Ellen has dis discovered pop-up and movable books when she began re reading them to her sons over 25 years ago. Today, she has more than 6,500 sons looking and laughing. Um, she has more than 6,500 books and thousands of uncatalogued movable ephemera. While at Yale's Medical School Physician Associate Program in 1987, she attended an exhibition at the Sterling Library on the history of movable books. It's there she learned about the scholarly dimension of what had been her passion. Ellen now lectures and writes about books, conducts workshops, curates exhibitions. In 2000, for example, she co-curated The Brooklyn Pops Up, History and Art of the Movable Book at the Brooklyn Public Library. 2005 saw two more exhibitions from her collection, one on the vo work of Wojciech Kubashta, the Czech artist and paper engineer, and its catalog with a pop-up won one of the prestigious Art Library Awards. Second was her exhibition, Ideas in Motion, a history and art of the movable book, which was at the Sojourner Truth Library at SUNY New Paltz. In 2004, the Pitts Papany Press published Ellen's The Hanukkah Puzzle Book, a book in eight parts for eight days of fun. For the libraries, Ellen served as a consultant and expert who reviewed the script of our exhibition, made recommendations to ensure that everything proper was represented and done correctly, gave us a vast amount of information, dates, helped us with accuracy, and with a sense of fun and style that I think has helped inform the exhibition you'll see. Speaking of sense and style, Ms. Rubin has also appeared on the Martha Stewart Show, CBS Sunday Morning, and Japanese Public TV presenting a history of pop-ups from her collection. She's a charter member of the Movable Book Society, writes for their newsletter, and is a member of the Girl Year Club. Ellen hosts the website, and there's the website address, um, to disseminate more information on the subject. In addition, she was kind enough to lend us examples from her collection for the exhibition. So without further ado, may I present the pop-up lady.
Thank you. Get a little organization here. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Mary, for that. that was a lovely introduction. And before I start, I really want to thank Sue Frampton, who's the program director here, who made this lecture series possible. And a very big thank you to Stephen Van Dyke, who is not here, but was the curator of the exhibition, Paper Engineering, Fold, Pull, Pop, and Turn. It's a mouthful. A mouthful. Uh, he contacted me two years ago, and we've had a lot of fun uh, learning about this exhibit and, and mounting it. Well, when I have the opportunity to talk about pop-up books, I always want to stress three things because I find that it amazes people. And that is, they were not invented in the 1970s. They go back over 700 years. I myself thought that. Oh, I forgot my microphone. Also, they were not for children. They were only for adults. And finally, what people really find astounding is that every single book with movable paper elements was handled by human hands. They are all hand assembled from the very first one to the ones you pull off the shelves in your libraries and in your bookstores. People love to learn about that. I also find them incredible teaching tools, and this proverb helps me tell you about it. I hear and I forget. I see and I remember, I do and I understand. I believe these books are very unique teaching tools and I'll be showing you examples as we go along. Okay, they began as instruments and tools. And the first one we know about is by Matthew Paris, who was a Benedictine monk in St. Albans, England. And he created this Vauvel. And the Vauvel is a calendar when will Easter come year after year? And for those of you who have not been to the exhibit, and the exhibit follows different mechanisms and explains about them and diagrams them, a vovel is a disc of paper over a base page. It could be several discs of paper. And through the center is a string, a paper device, a rivet, a grommet, something so that it could rotate around it. There may be a pointer that points to the information on the base page. Or there could be die-cut holes where information comes up through them. You're all familiar with Vauvels. I know you have all seen them. And Matthew Paris, we believe, was the first one who uh, invented it. What he also did was, in his Chronica Majora, he did itinerary maps. He was a consummate illustrator, and I think you can see examples of this here. And he was considered, in his time, a very fine historian. And monks wanted to make pilgrimages to Jerusalem. So if you think traveling is difficult now, try to imagine in the 13th century getting from England through Europe, through the Middle East to Jerusalem. It was arduous, it was risky, it was expensive, and most people could not do it. But St. Albans sat on the walkways, how people travel back and forth. And so Matthew Paris was privy to their comings and goings, and he created these maps where they literally could follow, step by step, how to get from England through the great cities of Europe to Jerusalem. But what he also created were these flaps. And if they were as large as the size of the page, they fold up into the book. We would call them today gate folds. And this is the first example we have found of the use of these flaps. Before we knew about Ramon Lul, I'm sorry, before we knew about Matthew Paris, we believed Ramon Lul was the first one to create a Bovell. And he was a Catalan philosopher, really a mystic. And he believed that if all of knowledge could be collated into a single system, we would understand the universe and we would understand God. And so what he did, oops, sorry, didn't mean to do that. On the base page, he had questions. And on the Volvels inside, he had units of information. And when you turned it, you would get more information. You could extract that. If you look in some textbooks on the history of computers, Ramon Lul would be credited with being the first to do something that's like a computer. He was the forerunner of the simple logic collating it all. And when I think about it, if this is the sum total of knowledge that existed at this time, this is the first page of Google. <laughs> the 
we cannot talk about early books without mentioning Peter Gutenberg and his use of movable type allowed for books to be produced in greater numbers and more cheaply. Before that, all books were handmade, hand illustrated, and hand copied. They were rare and they were expensive and most people did not have access to them. In fact, literacy was probably pretty low. The clergy, the uh, moneyed class, and some tradesmen could read. But with the use of movable type, that started to change because books were more available. This is also the beginning of the Renaissance, where intellectual pursuits were shedding the dogma of the church and going forward, looking into the humanities and the sciences. And there were many books on the military, navigation, and botany and anatomy. You have before you the most beautiful movable book ever printed. There is an example of it in the exhibition. Please take some time to look at it. It is Appianus's Astronomicum Caesarium. And I'll tell you here, I only speak English. So if my French, German, Latin, or Czech is not good, please forgive me for that. But Appianus was an astronomer in his own right. He studied the tale of Halley's Comet. And he printed this book in English stock Germany for King Charles V. And King Charles loved this book. He richly rewarded Appianus. He paid him the princely sum of $4,000. The book has 35 vovels, and they are actual instruments of astronomy to measure the planets, the moon that circulate around the planets, and all of that. And this is the most complex movable in the, in the book. It has seven layers of paper, and it measures mercury. Please note the string. Now, this book is from my collection. It is not an original. It is a facsimile made in the 1970s. The original would have had seed pearls along the strings. And for those of you who use or remember slide rules and the slides that go along them to help with the calculation, that's what the seed pearls would have done. We don't know how many books were produced, probably 1,400. But when you see the beauty of them, you know none of them were discarded. They do come up for sale on occasion. If you go to a high-end book fair, look for it, you'll be able to handle the book. It sells from anywhere from a half a million to three quarters of a million dollars. The oldest book in my collection is the Sacrobascos Sfera. And as was done at the time, there are three manuscripts bound into it, one on Aristotle and two by Sacrobasco. Not only do I love it because it's old, but I love it for the marginalia. And here you can see the previous owners wrote in the book with, in Latin, in black ink and red ink, they studied it. There are diagrams, there are formulae. Somebody really wanted to understand this book. Only the sphera has vovels, and they were added in the 16th century. The book was published in the 13th century when you had the Ptolemaic system, meaning that it was believed that the universe circulated around the Earth. Nonetheless, because it had so many valuable formula and information, it stayed in publication till the 17th century. And here you see the vovels and the hand coloring. I have a later edition, 1574, where the vovels are in situ, meaning they are printed flat on the page. It was expected of the owner of the book to cut them out and assemble them. Many times there was a text on the reverse side, so that text was lost, but I guess that's how they did things then. A wonderful teaching tool, and this is in the exhibition. This is Euclid's, the English translation of his elements, and the flaps were added at the time of the translation. So that with the flaps, you can see the solid geometry of it. Before I had the sphera, I had the opera medica. And because my background is in medicine, as Mary indicated, I love this book. This is a textbook for surgeons. During the Renaissance, the great universities and medical schools were opening up. 
and it was expected, it was part of the curriculum for a physician to know how to do their patient's horoscope because the horoscope was part of their diagnosis and treatment. So what this Volvel does is on the base page is the sign of the zodiacs and just within that are the organ systems of the body. The inner Volvel is to do the horoscope and by turning the wheel and using the pointers the surgeon was expected to find the most propitious day to do surgery on a patient who had a problem with one organ system and had a certain horoscope. Now I have to imagine before anesthesia and antibiotics, they all died anyway. <laughs> well, how is this physician supposed to learn? Doing a human dissection is the best way, but bodies were very scarce. The church did not allow for human dissection, except on executed prisoners, and I call them roadkill, bodies that were just left at the side of the road or in pauper's graves or things like that. So into that void came the resurrectionists, and they were literally body snatchers, and they would find bodies or steal them and sell them to the medical schools. In Scandinavia, you could pay for your tuition with a cadaver for medical school. Well, this is how physicians would continue to learn or would learn if they hadn't had access to a cadaver. It was the use of paper flaps. And the flaps actually mimic doing a dissection. The outermost flap being the skin and then going deeper and deeper into the body, the muscles, the nerves. And finally, in this case, a pregnant uterus. The flaps were also called fugitive sheets because unlike this remelin, which is one of the best examples of this uh, flap technique in anatomy, they were not bound into the book but loosely inserted. Hence they were lost, hence they were called fugitive. Now the partial in illustrations, and I apologize for not having the whole page, but the illustrations that are around it are really paying homage to God. We are created in God's image and we should not take these dissections lightly. And so these would be uh, allegories and biblical stories and things like that. If we jump ahead 200 years, we come to who I call Lady Modesty, really trying to maintain her dignity here but this is a teaching tool for obstetricians. And in this birth, as the flaps come down, we come, oh, sorry. We come to the baby, and the last flap here shows the baby coming through the birth canal. There are other deliveries in this book, cesarean, forceps, breach, but the last spread is of a partial birth abortion. It was not called that, but it was being done in 1848. And when I have the opportunity to put a book like this into an exhibition, I want people to see that. Because despite their politics or their religion, they should know that this procedure was being done that early in time. And finally, one more example of how powerful the uh, flaps are for teaching tools. This is an elephantine book, lithographed, and you see flap after flap. Some of them are quite minute so that a physician could learn about the body. I have not mentioned children yet. <laughs> and that's because there were no books for children up until about the 18th century. There were a couple, moral tales, how to behave, biblical stories. But basically, there weren't books that were targeted at children. And we come to the second watershed event, Gutenberg being the first, and that's the Industrial Revolution. And I'm not going to go into all the ramifications about that, except how it impacts literacy. There were, as I said, very few books for children before that, but literacy was slowly rising. It was an agrarian society. People didn't really have to learn how to read. But what the Industrial Revolution did was create a middle class, a middle class who had money, who had time, whose children didn't have to work in the factories, and now they could afford books. I'm not going to bog you down with a lot of legislation. These three are just from England, just to give you an idea how things moved along and literacy was really increasing. The Sunday school mo movement mandated that children come to church on Sunday so they could learn to read the Bible. The Public Libraries Act 
opened libraries throughout Britain so that people who could, uh, did not have access to books or couldn't own them could read books. And finally, the Education Act mandated that children be educated. One last piece of the puzzle, and this is a page from Comenius's Orbis Sensulium Pictus, which means the world in pictures. He was a Czech educator, and he realized that if children had images with the text, they would learn better. He wanted them to learn how to read the Bible. And so he is considered the father of the children's picture book. So we have the Gutenberg Bible, we have text being uh, re reproduced, and the images. I should also have mentioned earlier on that it was becoming feasible to produce more images in books with the, with the woodcut. They didn't have to be hand done. Finally, the first movable book for children. And there is an example in the exhibition. This was a very simple affair. Now you're looking at this and you're saying, well, this is just a pamphlet. Well, a book doesn't have to be a codex. A codex book is two covers and the pages bound into it. It is a way of giving information. And Robert Sayre developed this in 1765. And what he did, using the Harlequin figure, which is very popular in Europe. You see the Harlequin here? Uh, these were called Harlequinades because of the use of the Harlequin. What he did was take a sheet of paper, fold it in four parts, and print probably a copper engraving and hand colored on each of the four sections. There was text for the story top and bottom. He took a second sheet of paper, glued it top, glued it bottom, cut it across the middle, and then down to match the folds beneath. That also was printed and had text top and bottom. And so you could tell the story by turning up a flap, the bottom image would stay married to this image, but there would be new text for the story. Or you could turn down the flap, and there would be another image and more text. So by putting the flaps up and down, that's how the story would move along. And the alternative term for this book is a turn-up book. It's turn up, not turn it. The next couple of slides is just to give you an idea of the crescendo in printing for children that is now going to take place through the 19th century. And the very small part of it started in the early part of that century with Little Fanny, which was the beginning of a long series of books. And here the illustrations are removable, and Little Fanny has lots of exploits, and the child could change her costume according to whatever the story was. And for a collector, to be able to get all of the little pieces, that's a really big deal. Another example is Gulliver's Travels. Again, the illustration is removable. There's an easel back so that the illustration could sit on the night table or on the bed while the story was being told or was being read. But the really important part of this slide is Gulliver's Travels. Gulliver's Travels and Robinson Crusoe were written a hundred years before, and they were written for adults. But now you have stiff competition between publishers like Dean and Nister and Grimaldi and Routledge, and I could go on and on and on. They want that dollar. I won't say pound. And so they co-opted these adult stories for children. Mid-century, the crescendo is getting louder and bigger. More competition. They are coming up with new mechanisms in children's books all the time, trying to get you to buy them and read them to your children. At the same time, printing is changing. We went from copper engraving to lithography and then chromolithography where the color and the print were happening at the same time. And that printing was mostly done in German. They had the best expertise, presses, they had the trained labor force to hand assemble these books. And here is Little Red Riding Hood, who's also in the exhibition. Dean created this as a simple pop-up, and look at the mechanism. Just pull the string, and all the different parts of it pop up with the text below. 
Another example, this is a two inch wide diorama that entirely folds up into the book. And when you lift it, you get this depth of field, this wonderful chromolithographed illustrations, and even you can rock the cradle with a tab. This particular book was published by McLaughlin in New York. They opened their doors in 1858, when copyright laws, if they existed, were not being enforced. And McLaughlin copied all of the European children's books. They did come out with their own and they did have puzzles and games, and they stayed in business into the 1950s, and their, their imprint may still be seen on occasion because they've been bought out and bought out by so many other companies. And now we come to the top of the food chain, and that is Lothar Megendorfer. And he is considered the genius of paper engineering. Not so much because he invented the rivet, he did not, but with one pull of the tab, and I'll play that for you again. Watch the eyes, the jaws, the articulation in the shoulders and the elbow. He made it very, very lifelike. Now this illustration is on popuplady.com, and when you move your mouse, you can be just as if you're moving the tab. One of the reasons we consider him a genius is this was a time before radio, TV, Atari, Sega, Wii, iPad, and all of that. This was family entertainment. The book was expensive, and the family who bought it really used it as a form of entertainment. I like to think about when I watched Sesame Street with my sons, and I would just roar out loud at a joke that I knew was not for them, but was clearly put for the, in for the parent. That's what Lothar Megendorfer did as well. So his illustrations were on many, many different levels. The Movable Book Society thinks so much of Megendorfer that we created the Megendorfer Prize. And every two years at our conference, we award it to the best paper engineered book. We give it to the paper engineer for the prior two years. We just had our conference in Portland, Oregon. And for the first time, we gave the Megendorfer Prize to a European, Marion Bataille, for her book ABC3D, which is in the exhibition. The video is also on popuplady.com. Megendorfer was translated into 27 languages, and he was known worldwide. As I mentioned prior, most of the books were printed in Germany. World War I Put the end, put the end to paper engineering. The presses were destroyed, the labor force was dispersed, or became unaffordable, unaffordable, and paper engineering really languished. But there were a couple of people who kept it alive. And one was S. Louis Girard in England. And he created these self-erecting pop-ups. Before you saw a string was pulled or you pulled them up, now they're page activated. Just open the book, and I think that's what we're mostly familiar with today, and the pop-up will arise. He had a cottage industry. He would print and die cut all of the pieces for an individual spread, load them into a van, and the van had a Bucano book on the top, like Domino's Pizza did. And he would travel around to his employees, mostly women because of the fine motor coordination. He would drop off these parts, they would put them together in a spread, and then the van would go back and pick them up. Unfortunately, we have no images of that van, it's something I would love to have been able to show you. Sometimes there was an overage of these spreads, and he would put them just uh, in extra books, and he called them the potpourri uh, edition, as you see here. In the middle of the 1930s, here in America, Blue Ribbon Press copyrighted the term pop-up. We only found out last year from an English member of the Movable Book Society, she had found a book from about 1906 where in the title it said P-O-P-P, -P, sorry, dash U-P. That is the first time, as of now, that that term was used. 
Now, Blue Ribbon Press produced two series of books, one of American icons like Tarzan, and they did Little Orphan Annie and Flash Gordon and Mickey Mouse and Popeye, and the classic fairy tales. Unfortunately, the larger books were printed on very inferior cardstock. Whenever you open the book, the spine is damaged. I believe Pinocchio is sitting in the, in the exhibition. So usually I would have a cripple, something where I didn't care about the spine, but, but the pop-up was clear for me to show people, so I wouldn't have to ruin the one in my collection. Julian Ware is a real favorite of mine, working through the 1940s when paper and metal was scarce. And so his movables were very much like Megendorfer's, a single tab, you see here, and these various elements would move. There's an example of Ware in the exhibition, but this illustration is also at popuplady.com, and you can move it and make the uh, woman dance on the strong man. And finally, Geraldine Klein did a series starting in the 1930s up until the 50s. Very simple fan-folded pop-ups, but they were very effective and they're very sought after by collectors. We're not quite at the second golden age. I want to step out of the timeline for a moment to show you where pop-ups are used and have been used in other uh, items, and if, some of them are ephemera, and ephemera means anything that was made to be thrown away. So a ticket to a show would be uh, an example of ephemera. And here is a brochure for the Trinity buildings that were being built in New York City. And I realized when I, oops, sorry. I realized that this is a self-erecting pop-up, open the brochure. So this predates Bucano. We are always learning new things about when these uh, books were made. I sewed as a child, but I never had a pop-up needle case. My brother had, had uh, baseball cards, but he never had a pop-up baseball player. And here is Julian Ware again, only this time this use of his paper engineering and his illustrations are to sell handkerchiefs. And here, beautifully integrated into the illustration, are two linen handkerchiefs. Now, I went to elementary school in the 1950s, and we had to bring a clean linen handkerchief to school. And we had inspection. We had to show it to our teacher that we had this clean linen handkerchief. And finally, another piece of ephemera is this movable postcard. I started, I have always collected the, the ephemera, but I've only recently started to know, notice how risky the paper engineering is, how complicated. And then when you think about it, they had to go through the mail. This is a roller mechanism, and I don't want to know how it works. It's just so magical that when you pull the tab, the entire illustration changes. And you can see that these two demure women now are showing their legs. And I won't sing from you, but uh, in olden days, a glimpse of stocking was looked on as something shocking. Well, many of you, and I know one of you in particular, has already realized that erotica would be wonderful with paper engineering. <laughs> However, the Smithsonian did not give me enough time to go through that. <laughs> What they have done is I have been invited to speak at the National Postal Museum on the movable ephemera that goes through the mail, and that date is, is to be announced. Now we're coming to the second golden age, and I cannot introduce that to you unless I introduce you to Wojciech Kubaszta, and that says, hello, Wojciech Kubaszta, the only three words I can say in Czech. Uh, I've specialized in Kubashta, and as Mary said, I did an exhibition on his work, and so for this talk, I can't go into all of that. There is a biography of him on the website. But how he got involved in the pop-ups is he graduated from the Polytechnic Institute in Prague, where he lived all his life. He was an architect and a mechanical engineer. And during the 1950s, he worked for Slav Tour. This is already a communist country. And he made these souvenir pop-up postcards. And we believe that's where he got the idea to do that. Now here is an example of Wojciech Kubaszta at his best. 
his exuberance, his mechanical engineering, so that when you open up this book, he is never bound by the edges of the page. It just explodes off the page. And paper engineers today will all tell you that they have been inspired by his work. There were movable elements. He never dumbed anything down for children. There are blueprints, there are formula, there are equations. It's all part of his paper engineering. But in addition to being an architect, he was an Eastern European. And that meant he was steeped in the rich tradition of puppetry. And he saw these books as little puppet theaters. He was extremely popular during his day. Though most people don't know his name, they knew his work. He was translated into 32 languages and over 10 million copies of his books were produced. Many se selling on the streets of New York. I, want, I put this in here so you could see the articulation of the lion's jaw. This is really simple paper engineering, but used to the greatest effect. So his books were sold all over the world and on the streets of New York for one dollar. Where was I then? I don't know. <laughs> <Would've been laughs> The person we credit for making the second golden age happen is Wally Hunt, and he died last year in November. He was an advertising entrepreneur who found those books in New York City and got very excited by them and saw their potential for commercial use. And he approached Ardia, Kubashta's publisher in Prague, and said, we would like to order thousands of copies to be imported to the United States. Again, this was a communist country. And they said, oh, we're so sorry. It doesn't fit into our five-year plan. And they turned down the order. Wally was not to be daunted. He came back. He found the consummate paper engineer in Ib Penick and teamed up with Bennett Cerf, who was running Random House at the time. And they created a long series of books, pop-up books for children. Wally's company, Graphics International, was later bought by Hallmark Cards. And Hallmark produced a long series of pop-up books for children. Wally went on to create individual books and became the world's largest packager of pop-up books. And that's why we think they were invented in the 1970s. And here is the book that started it all, my son's copy of Papa Book of Trucks. I know I read this one and the dinosaur book to my young sons and I became more excited than they did. I think this spread was the one where I decided to collect. Maybe this was the dollhouse I never had. It was very lifelike. You could recreate all the movements. You could readily understand how the fire truck ladder would go up to a burning building and the dinosaur would chase after its prey. Uh, it's a very fine book, and it was a wonderful series. Well, what goes around comes around. They started for grown-ups, and they're for grown-ups again, along with children. And just to give you a couple of examples, here's the cocktail book. There's a recipe on every page. Maxwell Parrish's artwork interpreted in movables. Pearl Harbor. And this book is my favorite teaching tool. It is the quintessential teaching tool. And this spread can tell you how. Remember Max, uh, Matthew Paris's gatefolds? Well, in this, if you pull this gatefold down, the woman, the fireplace, and the lamp pop up to the background. The camera on the tripod with a lens opens to the foreground. Inside the gatefold, are these three lights. And on the base page are numbers. If you configure the lights in one way, you're going to get one kind of effect. Well, what is that effect? How do you know in advance? You pull out this base sheet, and it will tell you. If you configure these lights in one way, you'll get one effect. If you configure them in another way, you'll get another effect. This is teaching at its best. It is. Uh, engineered by Ron Vandermeer, and I had the occasion to meet him for the first time this year when I presented the Megendorfer Prize to Marion Bataille, and he was telling me that pop-up books 
made for education are being used in Britain. And there is a study recently done, which he has not as yet sent me, but will be on my website when I get it, telling me that the, the study shows that by the use of pop-ups, retention of the material goes up to 70%. Matthew Reinhardt's Pop-Up Book of Phobias. You can make this book open and close in the exhibition. When Matthew told me he was working on this book, I couldn't wait to see it. How is paper engineering going to go to interpret an emotion, a neuroses, no less? And what he did was just the simplest thing. For a pop-up to be successful, for me, it needs to be elegant, graphically, in the way it's designed, and it shouldn't have gratuitous paper engineering. Every element of paper engineering should be enhancing the story, the illustration, the material that's in it, so that you better understand it or enjoy it. And what Matthew did was use a V-fold. Now, the V-fold is so simple that when I do workshops for second graders and third graders, I show them how to make V-folds. I'm not an artist. I'm not a paper engineer. It's quite simple. You open the book, and the high-rise building opens into your chest, forcing you to look down, just like the apocryphobic would be looking down. I find it a great example of simplicity. This is Robert Sabuda's cookie count, which won one of the three Megendorfer prizes he has won. And Robert will tell you that, yes, it's quite difficult to have this voluminous house open up. The children love to see this just appear from between the covers. But what's really difficult is to make it disappear between the covers every time. As Mary mentioned, in uh, 2000, the Movable Book Society co-curated an exhibition at the Brooklyn Public Library. And this was uh, both the, I'm sorry, both the trade edition and the catalog, which is inserted inside. And of course, you recognize Maurice Sendak's uh, artwork. When you put your finger in the hole here and move it back and forth, Walt Whitman pops up and down. <laughs> uh, Maurice Sendak is a Brooklyn native, and, and that's why we got him involved in the exhibition. I had the great privilege of going to a bar, Ecuador, to see the book being made. But I can't stress enough that you should all go into the exhibit and go to the back wall and look at the eight-minute video of how these books are made. It's, they show you from a single spread from Angels, which was illustrated by Chuck Fisher, and paper engineered by the extraordinary paper engineer, Bruce Foster. And you see their collaboration. One lives in Texas, one lives in New York. The back and forth getting this spread made, and then of course the whole book, and then seeing it being assembled in China. Here, the technique is, is basically the same all over the world, that a single part of the spread will start, and she will cut, fold, glue, whatever is necessary, pass it down the table till the spread is done, and then when all the spreads are completed, they'll be bound into the books. Well, there was a genre of books that did take hold in the 1970s, and that is artist books, where artists used movable paper elements inside of books to express themselves. And I have a few examples. Here is Carol Walker's with her very uh, signature silhouettes. This book was produced for the Peter Norton Family Christmas Project, and there were 4,000 people on their Christmas list that year. My favorite miniature book artist is Mary Linepool Adams and this book is less than three inches that's the definition of a miniature book and every spread there are seven of them shows from birth to death a stage in life each from a Shakespearean play and then it's housed here in a replica of the Globe Theatre I was very excited to find this pop-up by Salvador Dali not only because it's Dali, but because, for medicine, this is on genetics. And he mentions Watson and Crick. Oh, sorry again. He mentions Watson and Crick, DNA, RNA. You can see the double helix here in the back. What you can see is embossed into the paper is a quote in Latin 
that has been translated to read, better than the Trojans, Chinese, and Nixon, Marilyn is best. <laughs> That's Dolly. And finally, because we're in Washington, I thought we should have a little bit of politics involved. And this book, The Quest for the Ethical Compass, has a compass actually embedded in the cover. And each spread is of a politician who has lost his way, ethically speaking. <laughs> it covers both sides of the aisle. I just happen to have Richard Nixon here for you. <laughs> so I'd like to leave you with this thought. Robert Sabuda, one of the greatest paper engineers working at this time, has said, pop-up books are the stepchildren of publishing. I could go a little further and maybe call them the Rodney Dangerfield of publishing. They get no respect. I speak to collectors and bibliophiles, and many people believe these are just throwaway books. They're incidental, they're inconsequential. And I'm hoping from what I've talked about today, their rich history and their beautiful artistry that you will think they are deserving of much respect. So please visit popuplady.com. There are uh, connection, links to paper engineers and special collections around the world, exhibits, the Movable Book Society, uh, templates to download and all of that. And I really thank you for your time and your attention. And if I can answer any questions, I'd be happy to try to do so. Thank you. Well, we do have time for questions, but we would ask that you come to one of the come to the microphone. There's one over here, um, and Ellen, would you, I I can see if we could have the lights up a little, it might be better. Somebody must have a question. There were such wonderful things covered <laughs> in all of this. Okay. Yes. Well, it has already started. You can see on YouTube and there are advertisements where the paper engineering has been digitized. And there are apps coming out where with uh, touch sensitive screens, things will pop up. And I think it's just going to explode. But especially for those of us who love books, that tactile feeling of opening and closing a book, of being in control, and of making it move, making it be interactive, sometimes it has sound. I don't think that'll ever go away. It's hard to crawl into bed with a little tab and you just touch it. You just miss part of the power and the control that you have. But it's exploding. There's no question about that. They are. If that is, uh, affecting well, you the know, same the, trend is yeah, the the bottom line. Well, I think that article addressed the fact that parents wanted children to be exposed to more text so they could learn faster. I don't know how widespread that is. I mean, the, they just came out. The New York Times with the best illustrated. Uh, they were all text-driven books. So I, I think it will continue. Certainly, uh, Chuck Fisher is coming out with an app for a picture book online. So the picture book, I think, is here to stay, whether it will be pr uh, paper or it will be uh, digital. I don't, I don't know. I d can't imagine that it's ever going to go away. And, and publishers will try to go with the flow. It's a very painful time in publishing, as you probably know. They're very expensive to produce. And I think some people will drop out and have already dropped out of the higher end books. They're lowering, lowering their price point. Pop-up books, you should know, are priced according to how much paper is used and how many glue points.
and the paper engineers will create these nesting sheets that every single part of a pop-up will be nested together like a puzzle to use as little paper as possible and they will try to refine the paper engineering so that glue bottle you saw in in the woman's hand that she won't have to use it as often that's really how they're priced uh, so I think there will be pay, uh, pop-up books I think the price point may drop has already dropped Please see the exhibition. I think there's a lot to learn there. Well, and I'd like to thank you all again for coming this afternoon. Um, I have two things quickly to say. One is that I also want to thank the uh, Smithsonian Libraries folks who helped arrange today and the long series of programs we're about to announce. Um, particularly the exhibition curator, Stephen Van Dyke, Susan Frampton, who's our program coordinator, who's in the back and can answer questions, and Liz O'Brien, who did a lot of the arrangements that we've benefited from. I also want to thank the National Museum of American History for their generosity in letting us use the auditorium today. They are our home for our exhibition gallery, but the gallery shows are all the product of Smithsonian Libraries. And I do encourage all of you to go around to the gallery and see Fold Paper Engineering, Fold, Pull, Pop, and Turn. I also want to invite you back to December 1 at noon in this auditorium for a lecture and book signing featuring pop-up artist Chuck Fisher speaking on creating a pop-up book and the enduring appeal of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. There'll be another, there'll be a, more in this series and the information on that can be found on the library's website. Um, and if you leave us your email, then we can make sure that you have access to all of that as well. Um, so thank you very much for coming today. Uh, thank you for being interested in pop-ups and if you haven't had a chance to go around and see the exhibition, please do so. <laughs>